The old warning that politics and religion make for strange bedfellows didn't faze Ruth Lyons. It was a lesson Carol Channing learned during the days when her religious background was seen as controversial. It's controversial now, but she considered it very important. And she, I don't know where she got her information, but she said, Carol's father, she explained along about the fourth time I was on, she said, I've got to tell the, the Carol's family history. Because she said, um, uh, my father was a prominent Christian scientist. She just sat there and said, anybody doesn't like it? Look, she came out all right. Look at her. There's nothing the matter with Carol. And I thought, oh, that's good. Oh, she was there to defend me. And in a television world surrounded by very managed personalities who walked down the center of every issue and ever revealing how they felt, she was a big, big relief and a difference that I think really made people gravitate to her. Guests who expected to plug a personal appearance or a new recording suddenly found themselves expounding on world events instead. Where are you from, Oscar? Where's your home? I was born in Montreal. I live in Toronto, Canada now. Oh, you're not, are you not French-Canadian, are you? You're not against the Queen or anything? All that trouble no, been going on no, up there, that I'm not woman. against the Queen. There's no trouble, really. Like many other countries in the past, in, in the British Empire, they're trying to throw off the colonialism that is Do you think it'll before. eventually happen? Oh, yes. I do, too. It has to. I do, too. I think because this is, too, this is too vast a country, Canada is, yeah. uh, to be under the rule of, a, of, a, of another country, I think. Right. I'd just like to have a flag right now. That's something I'm mad about as a Canadian. Closer to home, Ruth decried the increasing emphasis on style over substance. Isn't that silly, that business they're going on with now about where do the women buy their clothes? So what, you wear a Mother Hubbard or you wear a Dior gown? What's that got to do with how the United States works out? And charm over candor. What time is, uh, is the debate tonight? 9.30 Nine tonight. 9.30. With a great debate with capital G and capital D. Yeah. Mr. Nixon and Mr. Kennedy are, are debating. That's right. I think they're being entirely too adorable, both of them. Yes, they are. This won't be a fighting debate. I don't think either has the opportunity to ask the other a direct question. I don't like that kind of debate. I like them to stand right up to one another and say, do you think so? Why do you think so? Chin to chin. Chin to chin. But long overlooked social problems were beginning to create hairline fractures in America's seemingly placid surface. The expression of, of all of that uh, certainly uh, came to a head in 1968, which I call the year that the, uh, America had its nervous breakdown. And we must remember this was just on the edge of that, just on the tip of that, and Ruth saw it coming. And she knew there was going to be a women's revolution, and she knew there was going to be a civil rights. It was inevitable. Some people, well, the white or black, understood this was going to happen, and she was one of those people. In the process, she was creating an entirely new style of talk TV with a host who brought her own opinions front and center. There are many things in our own present government that if a candidate would get up and say these things, they would be highly critical of our government in many fields. And yet some of us think these things, but we don't dare say them. We've, we've got to be more outspoken. We've just got to be more outspoken. You know, you were Eisenhower, you were trained to salute the flag and everything America did was good. And it took me a long time to come to Ruth's awareness and insight. Dissent is as important an item as can be in a democracy. If you have no dissent, you have no democracy. She knew that in 1962, and I was just learning it. Fabulous. I like people to think. I like to try to make people think. And I think, I think that is one of the great things in, in radio and television today where we are losing out, where we are not putting enough controversy on there to make people think. We couldn't say, well, we think you should talk about this. We wouldn't do that. I mean, if it was something we really wanted her to talk about, we'd say, Mother, please don't say anything about it. I think the phones will ring off the hook. I'll be darn. <laughs> Her first topic was Vaughn entering the, the room after the applause. Well, guess what happened, you know. 
Two people have been killed and 75 injured so far. Isn't yeah. that dreadful? Is, this is America, and we have nobody to blame but ourselves. Our own bigotry, our own prejudice. That's a very brave thing that she's saying there. Nobody was talking like that in 1962. In that part of the country, in that day and age, to have that courage and to express that response, you know, that, that was powerful and, and uh, heroic. The woman had a, she had the heart of a lion. You know, if you have a blood transfusion, you don't know whose blood that is, do you? There's no difference in the color of the blood. There's no difference in the color of the soul, the spirit, the heart, the, the thing that makes a man, the dignity of a man. The 50-50 Club had always welcomed African-American guests, and as the early 60s unfolded, their chats with Ruth would bring the civil rights struggle to middle America. Boy, some of the vicious calls we got. Really? Oh. The so-called Christians called yes. up. Yes. And I want to tell you, I, some of the language that was used. But it hurts you to think that people are still so narrow and so cruel. And of course, they all bring up the one problem. I just hope your daughter will marry a Negro. That's always the only thing they can say. You know, they only can say that. It doesn't bother me one bit. One episode would remain indelibly etched in the memories of Ruth and her colleagues. Arthur Lee Simpkins was a singer, and he was appearing at the Beverly Hills Country Club. Ruth had heard his album, but she'd never met him before. And uh, she noticed that he was quite nervous. The first number he sang, he seemed very ill at ease. And I thought, what can I do to help him, you know, feel at home? I said, Arthur, you remember this tune you used to do, Marie? The dawn is breaking, Marie, that real cute, you know. And I said, go ahead and do that. Well, he did, and he began to snap his fingers and relax all over, you know. She said, you know, I, I bet you're a great dancer. And he said, well, not bad, you know. She said, get me a dance. Cliff, play. I walked over to him, and I started kind of dancing a little bit with him. And a white woman, a black man, dancing on television generated a lot of heat. My God, the phone started ringing off the hook. Oh, people calling, calling her all kinds of terrible names, you know. Because of the location of the show being in Cincinnati and being in the Bible Belt, there were thousands of letters that came in objecting to the fact that she was actually holding hands with what they would call then a, a colored person. She was just so far ahead of anyone else and things like that. I mean, I mean what, that was so, such an innocent thing to do. Oh, boy. I want to tell you I had, I had disgraced American womanhood. Yeah, yeah. You have never read such mail in your life. She got on it. She really lambasted the audience. I mean, she really, really did. I don't care how many letters they write me on things like that. If he walked in here today, I'd do the tango with him. <laughs> And the uh, response that came back by mail was in the tens of thousands, cheering her on, saying, you know, go, go, Ruth. Deliberately goading her critics, she brought Simpkins back for a second appearance and a second dance. By pairing Peter Grant with Mrs. Simpkins, Ruth's message was impossible to miss. And that really takes nerve because she really stuck her neck out, especially in those days when things were much more conservative and restricted. I, as a citizen, have an obligation to dissent, be critical when I feel it. There's nothing wrong with criticizing a president, and there's nothing wrong with speaking out on television for the equal rights of all of us, regardless of color, and that's what Ruth Lyons did long before, long before Martin was marching in Birmingham and Selma, long before the uh, turmoil in the South, reverse freedom riders. But the real civil rights movement had not yet begun to lift off, and she was already out there banging the door. I'm very impressed with that, really very impressed. I mean, especially me, because I can remember being concerned about being that open and out loud. You know, I had two and a half kids and a mortgage, and how do you sell this? People don't like scolds. 
You know, it's, they'd rather, you know, Lady Gaga, not scolds. You've got to keep on things. You can't give up completely. I don't say in our lifetime this problem will ever be solved. I don't believe it will, frankly. But I think we have a right to express our opinions on some of these things, don't you? She could scold. That's the power she had. She could do that and was not penalized for it. That's amazing. That's power.